people in America fear their government, and the government is being run by too many powerful agencies like the IRS and others, I think it's time the people take the country back through their representative government. Hi, welcome to Freedom TV. I'm Renee Kimball, your host, and we're going to have a great program for you today. Judith Golden and Earth Magic Tours. These are not your grandmother's tours. <laughs> so I think you'll really enjoy this. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've been doing all week. I've actually been going in and poll watching, actually looking at the entire process of when the ballots come in and what happens to them. And what we're going to do is I'm going to run a few pictures for you. These are sanctioned. They were done with the permission of the Elections Board. And it will give you an idea of how the process works. So the first picture coming up is the boxes coming in. These are the red ones are from the drop boxes. So these are the ones going back out, but they come in and they're, they uh, have the ballots in them. The next one shows you some of the ones from the library. <clears throat> these are the boxes that come in from the library. They are locked at the library and there's a slot in the top so you can just put your ballot into it. And then they come into the elections office and for the next one, this is the room that they come into and this is the room where they check them to make sure that they're signed the back of the ballot is signed, that they're not torn, there's something isn't terribly wrong with them and then they're put into boxes and sent over to the next room which is the scanning room and here they all get scanned in and if you see that little box in the front that is the order that they're in the box is the order that they're scanned in and so the signatures come up and that particular order and in the next picture you'll be able to see the box we keep coming back to me <laughs> I'm not that terribly interesting <laughs> If we go to the uh, the the one up top, the uh, standalones, it'll, it, the uh, series, it might be a little bit easier, but that's okay. This is the box, and in the order that they are in the box, is the order that they're scanned in. So when they signature, when from here after the scanning, they go into the signature room, and that's the next picture. And this is the room where they compare the signature on the ballot with the signature on the screen. And this is, uh, I understand in past years you were actually able to be inside the room and previous to that you were actually able to stand behind the person, which to me would have been much more advantageous because from the position you are outside the room at this window, you can see what's on some of the computer screens, but unfortunately you aren't able to see the ballots. So unless somebody actually lifts the ballot up to their face, you can't tell whether this, the signatures are the same. So unfortunately, uh, we are not able to see much of this process. And I think the main value of our being there is the presence outside the window. Not that I think anybody would be doing anything purposefully, but this is kind of a mind-numbing job, to be honest with you. And can you get tired? Can you get a little bit off color, a little tired, maybe a little hungry? Sure, anything could happen. And the unfortunate thing is we are not able to see whether the person is is actually doing it accurately or not. I'm assuming that they are and I do not under any circumstances believe there's any ill intent in any of the people who are working here but I do think people get tired and it would be better to be able to see be able to check more on what they're doing. The next uh, stop 
that we get is it goes back to that first room and here it's put into precinct order. So the boxes are now sorted out into specific precincts for Multnomah County. Again, this is all Multnomah County, and each county does it entirely differently. So the process from here, it is all sorted. Then it goes downstairs for the next picture and goes into the room where the ballots are actually opened. Way back in the left-hand side, you can see a little bit of a green, and that's the green room where all the ballots are stored, both at overnight and when they're opened and flattened out. The boxes that you see on the carts are the ones that are being brought to each election board table. There, I think there are 28 tables, and there are four people at each table. The next picture gives you a little bit better close up. This was taken between the barriers because uh, the barriers were smoke colored and all the pictures turned out kind of bad. This you can see that there, the room goes back a long ways and there are four people at each table and these people are the ones who are responsible with opening the ballots, opening the secrecy ballot and the it's secrecy envelope and then checking the ballots. The 18, I think 16 tables that you can see up front next to the barriers, you can pretty much see everything that everyone's doing. Unfortunately, that whole area in the back there that you see uh, directly behind these women, you cannot see anything of what these people are doing, which is incredibly unfortunate. As I understand it from people that I spoke to, in past years, uh, observers were actually allowed in that area to observe. So I think that we kind of hmm, made a back step here in our ability to have the system be transparent. At no time, I have to really compliment the people at the elections office. We were treated with respect. We were treated graciously, kindly. All of our questions were answered. Nothing was ever hidden. And I felt very confident in the people who were there and the people who were doing the job. I have to give them high marks for coming day after day and doing this because it's a toughie. It's a really tough job. So now they're opening the ballots. You what the process is, they open the ballots. After all of the secrecy ballots are out of the mailing envelope, they take the envelopes off the table. Then they start working with the secrecy ballots. And then here they are opening the secrecy envelopes and taking the ballots out. The ballots are not unfolded at this point. They are just left in a pile, so you really can't see them. Any of the uh, ballots that came in and didn't have a secrecy envelope inside the mailing envelope, envelope are put inside a manila folder. They're not looked at separately and the only time that they are opened is at the end process and end of the process when they're opened here. These are the opening of the ballots. Oregon is the only state that is allowed to do something called enhancing the ballots. And what this means is clarifying what the voters' intent would be. On this particular ballot, you can't see it really well because I'm not a terribly good photographer, but there is a, a circle, both two circles are uh, blacked out. One of them has an X over it. So the intent is assumed to be that the X one is I don't want this person, I want the other person. So what the, uh, the ballot person does at the election board table is put a white sticky over that second one so that when it goes through the machine, it will be red. Otherwise, it will be counted as an overvote and that particular vote on that particular person will not be counted. The next a picture is a, an example of enhancement where the person obviously didn't read the instructions and used a number 12 pencil and it was so light you could practically see through it. The machine's not going to read this so the, uh, the worker marks it over with a red highlighter and this the machine will read. One of the things that they are supposed to be doing is consulting with the other people at the table anytime they change anything on a ballot. And the next picture shows you one of the best tables there. That was a group of four ladies right up next to the window. They set every ballot that there was a question on aside and then conferred on those ballots after they were done with all the rest, which I think was probably the best process. A lot of times people would um, confer just for a second with maybe one other person. I think that this is probably one of the weakest points that this process that the ladies were following is the one that should be followed. And uh, in that regard, I think that I would like to see it a little bit more standardized in that regard. But that's a quick and um, easy 
look at the process. These are some of the ballots that were uh, not deliverable. They were stacked in an area and apparently they're going to be moved or warehoused, archived or destroyed in December. And these are the machines. These are the little puppies that all those flattened out ballots will be going through and that will be starting on Tuesday. So if you want to come ballot watch, come on down. Uh, anyone can do it. Just come down, make sure you have ID. Don't wear any perfume or anything like that because there's a lot of people there uh, who might be sensitive to that sort of thing. So uh, it's your opportunity to have a say in what's going on and have an actual look at the process. Now we're going to quick smart go to surviving and thriving and this time it's going to be navigation and fish hooks. So with that we will chuff off into the distance with Surviving and Thriving and in the future I will tell you about a special show on the ballot process that I'll be doing. Surviving and Thriving. You can avoid getting lost out in the wilderness by simply having a small button compass like the one I have here. A little compass 101 for you. Unlike a standard compass, a button compass has a floating dial instead of a floating needle, which is significant in the fact that the north on the, on the dial here is always going to be locked in to magnetic north. Significant is where you point the compass because that is going to be your line of direction. As I'm holding my compass right now using this point right here as my line of direction, it's indicating to me that I'm pointing in a east-southeast direction, which is also called a bearing or an azimuth. I'm going to point it out directly in front of me, look out there and see what object I can walk to. In this case, it's going to be that big ponderosa pine tree out there about 100 yards. When I get to that pine tree, I'm going to redo this process all over again from object to object so that I continue on a straight line going east southeast. It's always a good idea before you venture into the woods away from your car to get your bearings. In this case we have an east-west running road. I'm going to be going to the south of this road so if I get disoriented or lost all I really have to do is go in a northerly direction to get back to my automobile or to get back to the road. If you take a few moments just to do this simple orientation before you leave, you're going to avoid getting lost. One of the absolute easiest ways to procure food out here next to collecting insects, which I understand some of you may have some problems with, is with fish hooks. Whether it's fish or fowl, an assortment of fish hooks attached to leader with some weights in it is going to provide you a real good opportunity to put food in your stomach. Surgical tubing is another one of those multi-useful items that I put in my survival kit. There's a lot of uses for them. As a drinking straw, as a tourniquet. Some instructors like to put them in their kits as triggering devices for snares, but I put them in my survival kit for a whole different reason. At a survival clinic recently, my wife scolded me for introducing my slingshot as a viable option for procuring food. It's way too complex for the majority of your audience, she said, and she was right. That is, until I figured out a way to simplify it. I reasoned that I could take the same two components that I used to revolutionize survival shelter construction, duct tape and zip ties, and make a pretty good slingshot. I discovered that I could make a pocket by overlapping the surgical tubing by approximately four inches and securing the ends with zip ties. Zip ties could also be used to secure the tubing to the two posts on the slingshot.
From experience, I do recommend doubling the zip ties for added security, though. Another adaptation that I came up with a few years ago was adding a wrist brace. This allowed me to stretch the surgical tubing much further and hold it longer without overstressing my wrist. It made for a much more powerful wrist rocket. So powerful, in fact, that it spawned another idea. By shortening the height of my post, I created a slingshot that could shoot arrows. And in doing this, this would allow me to go after game much bigger than a rabbit. This is called an Hawaiian sling, also known as a poor man's spear gun. It would have served Tom Hanks' character well in the movie Castaway. They really pack a wallop. Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV, and I'm here today with Judith Golden. And we're going to be talking about Earth Magic Tours. Now, first of all, I love the name. Thank you. How on earth did you come up with the name Earth Magic Tours? <laughs> <laughs> I had a business that was retail wholesale in Olympia for 26 years called Earth Magic. Ah, there you so go. So I just uh, went with that. Yeah, that's a great name. Thank you. Now tell me a little bit about why you decided to go from retail to taking people on tours of Southeast Asia. I mean, that's that's kind of a jump. <laughs> well, in my retail store, it really wasn't. I brought home photos from all of my journeys. My customers looked at them and said, I want to go. I wanna so go. I put a tour together. <laughs> and then I uh, put a, started putting educational tours together and then family tours together. I have a honeymoon tour. A honeymoon <laughs> tour. That's great. Great. And so these are our tours. That, and now one of the things that I notice is that when you go on these tours, these are not your, you know, let's stay at the Hilton tour. No, and we don't go on the tour buses either. <laughs> exactly. That was the, the amazing thing that I found, was that your tours are what everybody thinks they're going to get when they sign up for a tour, <laughs> but never, you know, it's like, and here we have the stock photo of the pyramids. Right. Oh, goody. <laughs> so why did you decide to take this a little bit more rustic? Mm -hmm. and, because, and describe some of the things that you do on your tours. Sure. They're a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I take people to um, play the way I play. And I felt like I created journeys for people to see Thailand and Cambodia through my eyes because I don't think I see these two countries like most people do. And I stopped listening to media and stopped listening to the warnings and, yeah. and everything and just went. So I've met a lot of people there. I have a lot of friends in both countries who have shown me what it really is. They're not just the tourist routes. Right, and you get to see the actual the way people really live. Yes. What what do you find about these tours? One of the things that, that I wanted to mention about your tours is that there's a, a, a shall we say, an added thing on the itinerary that a lot of tours don't get. And that's the purpose of why you're oh, actually yes. doing these. Thank you. Because their tours, yes, people are going, they're having fun, but there's also a reason that you're going on these tours. Can you talk, tell me a little bit about, yeah, okay, tours are great and everybody has a lot of fun and they're wonderful, but why did you add, decide to add on this other component? Describe mm -hmm. it for me and, and tell me why you decided to add that in. Sure. When um, I first decided to go to Cambodia, everybody in my life said, are you crazy? It's <laughs> dangerous there. So I got my ticket. <laughs> but in, in preparation, I visited with many Cambodian survivors and I asked them, what could I take as a gift from America to um, people in Cambodia? What could I take as a gift? And they were numb with ideas and, and options because Cambodia is a country with nothing. Yeah. So anything works. Yes, like, anything works. <laughs> bring us anything, we'll take it. So I uh, talked to a Cambodian monk in Olympia and asked him what I could do. I knew there were many landmine victims in Cambodia and I asked what would be um, the most accepted, what would make somebody the most excited um, a gift? And he said very simply, papers and pencils and pens. 
and so that started my little campaign. I asked for donations and um, worked with Vietnam vets and bought a pallet of school paper and slowly but surely I fill right. up everybody's suitcases that are going over. I tell them leave space leave because space. <laughs> we'll put school supplies in and we'll give them all away and then you go shopping and fill up right. your suitcases and bring Raise it all, all back. back. So what you know a great it, idea. it's it's a plan. <laughs> right. And it's a win win. My yes. gosh. Yes. Besides who needs to be taking more than a couple changes of clothes That's anyway? it. So you That's just take it. a big suitcase That's right. and fill it up and take it along with That's you. That's right. So how is, how, when you first started, how long have you been doing this now? About 12 years. About 12 years. Mm -hmm. So, and how many tours have you, do you do one a year or two well, a year? Well, a couple or? of years. I was doing three and four really? a year. So I was hopping back and forth oh my um, gosh. <laughs> a lot, but um, I missed a year. I only went once that oh. year. So it, it's just okay. varies. It really so varies. varies on the number of people sure. and how many people do you actually bring with you mm -hmm. on the tour? One time I, well many times I've just taken myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes those That's are a good more tour. fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I've taken up to um, 13 guests and some of my really? family members. That's a crowd. It was fun. Really? Yeah, it was really fun. We did a lot. Oh, describe some of the things that you do on these tours. Mm -hmm. Where do you? What if we're kind doing, of um, usually, uh, I like to take people two weeks to Thailand. You don't really know you're there until you know, unless yeah. you've gone for two weeks. And so, um, usually, I like to say two weeks in Thailand and one optional week in Cambodia. Some people don't have time. Some people don't want to go to Cambodia. Right. And um, so I do it as an option. So uh, we'll land in Bangkok and go to the Grand Palace and some of the most gorgeous temples in the world to learn the true Thai culture. Right. Once you step into that realm, you uh, learn very quickly what's appropriate and what's not appropriate in, within the culture. And then, of course, we have to go to the ruins. We have to go ride the elephants and play yeah. with all my elephant friends. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have to hit the beach. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. And then Cambodia, of course, is right. ruins. And then how do you, what do you do about eating on the trip? I eat like crazy on the trip. <laughs> I eat everything I see. The food in Southeast Asia is always fresh. Really? Everything is picked or caught or prepared usually that morning. Really? Yes. I don't I forget all about chocolate and sugar and stuff when I'm there because there's too many good really sticky good rice thing. and mangoes mm. and all <laughs> kinds of yummy stuff and I eat all day long like the Thai people. Right. So and it's basically you're eating what the normal average Thai person would be eating. Yes, I'm a vegetarian. Right. It's very easy to be a vegetarian in Southeast Asia because um, that's how the monks eat and it's very well respected there and there's even vegetarian holidays. So really? it's really easy for me, it's a piece of cake. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you're on these tours, when what are some of the reactions of the people? I mean, do they do people really understand what they're getting into no. when they do this? <laughs> no. And one of my favorite things to do in 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 line of this surprise the, the surprise <laughs> tour is I like to put people on a boat. I don't tell them we're going on the boat. I just say, "Well, now now we're going to do something really fun." And we get in a little tiny boat, fill it, and we fill it with coconuts, and we just cruise down the Chao Phraya River, the River of Kings, and and it's fascinating. It's just fascinating everywhere. People are clicking the cameras, and everything's so much fun. And right. then we round a bend, and then there'll be an elephant standing there, and I wait to see who is going to notice it first. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you know, people squeal and, and delight and lean over in the boat. You know, you have to and, yeah. balance the boat. And then um, we'll pull up to the dock and go play with the elephants. And if we're lucky, and if I time it just right, the herd of elephants will coming will be coming into the river to take their bath as we arrive. Which oh. is like, are you kidding me? Yeah, <laughs> it's really. incredible. So this is the real up close and personal tour. It's yes. definitely not the hands off. Oh, I want to just see it through a glass <laughs> mirror here. And, you know, it's like. You know, no, but I, I definitely like look like dirty. a tourist with all my cameras really? and stuff hanging on yeah. me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had anybody who's just freaked entirely? At me? No, I meant at the, oh, on at, the tour. On the tour and just gone, I thought I was going to the Hilton. 
Oh, no. <laughs> no, really? No. That's excellent. No, we have too much fun to stop and think about it. Really? So we really do. Even the people who are kind of a little bit reticent, they kind mm -hmm. of get into it pretty Absolutely. quickly. It's not, it's not hard to no. just sink right in once you've gone through those first initial days of, of uh, culture shock. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> But what do you mean there's no TV? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, there is TV, actually. <laughs> oh, really? So, so, so there is TV in most there's of the places that you go satellite TVs. Um, internet is abundant. It wasn't in Cambodia. The first time I went to Cambodia was right after they re e they allowed the monks to return. And mm. um, it was still very um, new to tourists. I went in 2003. Um, the, the country was just opened in 2001. So I got to Whoa. go when it Very was freshly soon. opened and wow. people were really excited to have company from really? the outer world. Are they, are they still very um, surprised? when you show up in these <laughs> rural and remote places? Oh yeah, I've been screamed at by children. They thought I was a ghost. <laughs> Okay, a ghost, all right. <laughs> Cambodia well. is filled with ghosts from the war there. And oh. so, and, and Cambodian people are very superstitious and they believe in the ancestors. Oh. So, yes, I've been a ghost so, a few times. <laughs> so they looked at you and went, oh my God, you're a ghost. Mm -hmm. One baby screamed so hard, uh, we couldn't calm him down. So the mother had to take him somewhere else. And the grandmother and I sat and held hands and laughed. I don't speak Khmer, but I speak Thai. Well, she was a survivor, so she was in a Thai military camp right. and had to learn how to speak Thai so we could oh, communicate in Thai. And excellent. grandmas are grandmas in any language. That's true. <laughs> well, we're going to take a short break and go to a video that uh, Judith has put together about some of her travels. And I believe this one is going to be uh, Cambodian Wells. This is another project we'll talk about after the video. So right now we're going to take a short break and have a look at some of Judith's tours. And this one in particular is in Cambodia and it's about the well project that she helped put together there.
Welcome back. I think that gave you a little bit of a flavor of what Earth Magic Tours is all about. And I'm here with Judith Golden, and we're talking about all the projects. And the projects you named off for me, it's like, I feel like I'm standing still, not doing anything <laughs> in comparison to what you're doing. And one of, the, one of the projects that really impressed me the most was this water well project that you did in Cambodia. Tell me a little bit about how this all started and, and what your whole purpose in doing that was. Sure. I took a, a big group with um, almost $1,200 in collected donations. Mm. And tons of school supplies to a very, very poor village full of landmine victims. And we spent Thanksgiving Day with them one year mm. in the village with the chief whose hands were blown off, and wow. every person in the village had parts of their bodies blown up by landmines. And it was mm. so much fun to be with this tribe, this village of people who are so have nothing and no means and yet so sweet. And really? at the end of the day, I, I have a, a son who's adopted me and uh, I said to him, Renette, this was really cool. We did a very cool thing. I said, what's next? <laughs> 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 and he said, mom, I think now we can put a water for the village. I said, good idea. Wow. So I said, you tell me how, what we have to do, and the next time I come back, we'll do it. So we emailed back and forth, wow. and he found that um, there were 11 villages around Angkor Wat with no water. The Khmer Rouge has broken the water pumps and destroyed the wells to enslave the people. And mm. it's been decades these people have been without water. And the thought of it just cringed my heart. So um, that was the next project, to start building water wells building water and wells. when we did the two that you saw in the little video um, it inspired some other people and so now I've been given donations to go build two more and another um, donation to build one went already with a friend to mm. hook up with my son and they're building a new water well next week oh my god <laughs> and I want I want to point out that the donations that you get, you're not relying on government grants no. or foundations who rely on government grants. Nope. This is just <laughs> you it's out just there telling people about what you're doing mm -hmm. and getting them on board with it. So to me, this is the most direct charitable gifting you can possibly have. This is people mm -hmm. see immediately what's going on with their mm -hmm. the, the feeling they have in their heart and the way that they want to help people. And this, the, you know, you don't have to wait six months down the block in order to see what's going on. And it's, you know, you don't see your money go up to the top, filter <laughs> back down, and hopefully some of it goes to what you really wanted to yes. do, do in the first place. So this is, this is an incredible project. Well, a good example of that, too, is right after the tsunami. Oh, I was in the ocean <laughs> um, about a week and a half before the tsunami really? hit. Whoa. Yes, in that area. And I lost friends in the tsunami, and I wasn't even unpacked when I got home, opened my suitcase and turned on the television and saw what was happening over and over, over and yeah. over again. And mm. I had to do something. I had to. So I called um, school teacher friends of mine in Washington, California, Florida, and New York, the four corners of America. Mm -hmm. And they put their students to work making Valentine's Day cards to take for oh, me to really? take with me. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So I took about 2,500 Valentine's Day cards to um, the land that was hit the hardest in southern Thailand and passed them out on Valentine's Day. Oh, really? Yes, oh and God. that was That's delivering incredible. the best wishes and so much love from these all these children in America who had seen this tragedy on television and wanted desperately to do something, didn't know what to do, but they did the best thing they could possibly do. They sent right. love. They sent love. They sent love. And On the, Valentine's yes, Day, no less. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what the coolest thing ever. Thing. That yeah. is an amazing thing. It was happened. very cool. And this isn't done through a big sponsored foundation. No. No, this is just people helping people 
yes. helping people. Yes, and that, that to be. me, <laughs> that is that is the essence of charitable giving. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, me little, too. Yeah, little <laughs> eyes here going, little leaking in the eyes here. <laughs> Nothing happening. Um, and I do want to thank you so much for for doing this kind of stuff because to me this is this is what charitable gifting is all about people actually accomplishing something by doing this now one of the thank things you, you uh, told me about was some of the plans that you have for the future mm -hmm. of uh, possibly doing bigger and better things mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that I like to um, um, be in Cambodia with um, people there because they are so eager to learn. Cambodian people have been really, um, uh, it was a very huge tragedy what happened in the country and um, in Cambodia I'm old. <laughs> it's really? a country wiped out of their elders from famine and disease and war. Really? Yes, and I'm old there. And wow. so many, many people now call me grandma and I love it. That's incredible. And um, they deserve help. And so I would like to um, put together some schools or at least lessons in English so that the local people in Cambodia can then talk to the tourists right. and take over their right. own businesses. Right. Many businesses are moving in from foreign um, countries because Cambodia is new and right. they need help. So they need they're help. going, yay, people are helping us but we want to do it ourselves. They need yeah. to do it themselves so right. they have a future. That's so with excellent. the tool of English, they would have that. They would have the ability to yes. communicate with the businesses that yes. are coming in and work for them. And I take school supplies like crazy there, and, and even the adults are, are just so thankful to have a spiral notebook and a pen. Wow, it's amazing when you think about it. We throw that's, paper away. It's that's so deal. common to yes. us. It's just, you know, you can go yes. to to any one of the, like Salvation Army or Goodwill mm -hmm. or Deseret, and you can pile up those mm -hmm. 25 deep for $10. Mm -hmm. And yet over there, they're worth more than gold. Yes, there, people are desperate for education in Cambodia. That's incredible. Now, how has the regime changed over there in the 12 years that you've been going? Oh, has, well, I've been going since 2003 to right. Cambodia. And what has changed, drastic changes. The first time I went, there were no paved roads. There was no t ATM. There was um, one bank. Oh my God. And um, no hotels. Whoa. They were guest houses and beautiful, beautiful old colonial guest houses from wow. when the French were in control of the country back in the 40s and 50s. And um, just really sweet little town. Well, now, yeah. <laughs> now <laughs> already, in two thousand five years later, five years later the Japanese God. have gone in and paved the main roads, and the locals are, yay, thank you so much. And the Japanese are building hotels, the Germans, the Swedes, everybody's in there building hotels. The Chinese really? are, are, are hiring um, Cambodians for cheap labor. Yeah, well, <laughs> And that's all true. these fancy hotels are going up, and no one's staying in them yet. I would be embarrassed. <laughs> To stay well, yeah, because in a you fancy know people hotel. And you stay in a ho fancy hotel. Oh my God. I would rather give that yeah. money to the locals right. and stay in a cute little guest right. house. Yeah, so would I. <laughs> We're going to take a short break and come back, and then, and then you're going to have an opportunity to ask some questions of Judith, and I'm sure you might have a few. It's not exactly an accessible place for us to know too much about. In fact, I don't really know anything about Cambodia. But we're going to take a short break right now, and we're going to see a film by the Motion Moving Picture Institute has sponsored this one. It's called Freedom's Fury. It's uh, kind of an interesting look at how people in another country react in a particular situation. And also, we're going to have two shorts on global warming. Now, one thing you'll notice about this show is that we don't actually play it safe. And if you're at the extremes of the political spectrum on either side, then this show might make you a little uncomfortable. So I think that both sides of an issue deserve to be heard and have a little bit of airtime. So this is a a uh, little bit of a short, uh, two little shorts on another perspective of global warming. So freedom's fury and global warming. Fifty years. 
years ago, terror had another name. Hope mobilized an entire country. And a group of unlikely heroes carried the torch of freedom for a brutalized nation. A water polo showdown, now known as the bloodiest game in Olympic history. Fifty years later, finally, the story will be told about a game that became legend and a popular uprising that shook the world. One team, one country one chance for revenge. Freedom's Fury. There's something in these pictures you can't see. It's essential to life. We breathe it out. Plants breathe it in. It comes from animal life, the oceans, the earth, and the fuels we find in it. It's called carbon dioxide, CO2. The fuels that produce CO2 have freed us from a world of backbreaking labor lighting up our lives, allowing us to create and move the things we need, the people we love. Now some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? Carbon dioxide. They call it pollution. We call it life. You've seen those headlines about global warming. The glaciers are melting. We're doomed. That's what several studies supposedly found. But other scientific studies found exactly the opposite. Greenland's glaciers are growing, not melting. The Antarctic ice sheet is getting thicker, not thinner. Did you see any big headlines about that? Why are they trying to scare us? Global warming alarmists claim the glaciers are melting because of carbon dioxide from the fuels we use. Let's force people to cut back, they say. But we depend on those fuels to grow our food, move our children, light up our lives. And as for carbon dioxide, it isn't smog or smoke. It's what we breathe out and plants breathe in. Carbon dioxide, they call it pollution. We call it life. Hi, welcome back. Judith, I'm so excited about these tours. I want to go. <laughs> Come with me. I want to go. Oh, we'll have so much fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've never been anywhere. My big excursion was to Australia for a few years, and that's, well, hey, that's like going to Southern California, basically. It's not really like another country. Well, every time I go, I do different things. Really? So different things happen to me every time, too. It's, it's right. always fun for me as well. What's the most exciting thing that's happened to you? What's the, the most incredible thing? Oh, I've you? got it. The most exciting thing that ever happened to me in Thailand was one day when I was visiting the elephants. There's 170 in the herd now. When I first started going, there were only 47. Wow. So, yay, our elephants yeah. are growing in number. <laughs> Thank you day. for the donations, everyone. <laughs> and um, one day I was visiting 
And a, f a friend of mine who is an elephant trainer said, Judith, if you ever came here in pants, instead of those dresses that you always wear, we could go swimming with the elephants. Oh, I okay. reached in my bag, I put on my <laughs> pants standing right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not missing this one. I didn't hesitate for two seconds. Yeah. And so up on the elephant we went and out into the middle of the river. This is an elephant I've known for years. Oh my gosh. She laughed the whole time because I could not shut up. I kept going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm really doing it. Oh, this is so much fun. Oh my gosh. I just could not shut up. So the elephant was laughing all the way into the river and all the way back out again. But she took me way out into the middle That's of the river incredible. and then dunked. So I was into water from my waist up. It looked like in the photos I'm sitting on top of the water. <laughs> So that was really That's the incredible. most thrilling thing I think I've ever done in Southeast Asia. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that qualifies as, yeah, I'm still as smiling a, from a it. class one <laughs> thriller. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't mind. And going I got over there. to sit with two live tigers. That was really fun too. Really? Like, right, sit down with them. That was like. Really? Oh, were they uh, like tame tigers? Yeah, hopefully? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not out of the cage. Yeah, they're out of the cage. They're out of the cage, mm -hmm. oh. and they're our tame. So really, okay. <laughs> everything well, was really good. fun. Well, if you do that have was thrilling. Any, if you do have any questions for uh, Judith, I think the phone numbers are coming up. I can't see them in here, but do give us a call, and hopefully we'll be able to answer any of your questions. I'm sure Judith will be able to, and if you have any for me, but mainly Judith. Judith, I can't believe that you do this on a real regular <laughs> basis. As I much mean, as possible. Do you ever get tired of it? No. No. Oh, no, because each journey brings new everything. Right. New everything, new experiences, everything. Right. And uh, I make new friends. Do you go mainly to the same places, or is it each time you go a different sort of a different location? Or? I like to do um, familiar places. I like to do things that I know will excite my guests. Right. But I always like to throw something new in the mix for myself. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm still exploring yeah. and doing and, and things. But my friends in Southeast Asia love to mix it up with my groups. And it makes it more interesting for everyone if right. we can all go do something together or have dinner together or you right. know and it and it my groups the people in my groups are happy because then they get real Thai culture with real Thai people or right. real Cambodian right. culture with you know yeah so it's more fun to, to just do There's things like nothing that. Nothing worse than going to a country and expecting to see the culture <laughs> and winding up talking to somebody who went to Harvard. Sure. You know, it's like <laughs> and this is I don't know this is not exactly what I would be expecting if I, I went yeah. to Southeast Asia. I believe we do have a call. Do you have a question for Judith? Uh, my original question, uh, before the, the last little uh, film roll in there, my, my original question was going to be, uh, have you uh, investigated your carbon footprint for the tours? But I'm going to let that one go and ask <laughs> my second question. Um, the uh, second question is, uh, have, uh, be, being that the, uh, the, the water, uh, the well water, the, wa uh, the wells that uh, you go through there and, and do, um, I have learned, uh, you having trouble hearing? Yes. Hello? They need to turn, us up, turn you up in here so oh, we can okay. hear you. There um, we go. The, uh, um, let's see. The, uh, w one, uh, one thing that I've learned in the past few years uh, a, a, an outfit that I've been uh, hearing about for a long time, Dean Kamen. Uh, he's an inventor. He does a lot of things. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Segway, that little stand-up two-wheel uh, two roll-around gizmo, um, he has come up with something called the Vapor Compression Water Distiller. Um, it's a standalone device. Um, it uh, originally started out as a electrical generator, um, but what he's done with the excess heat from that generator is made a device that you can put one end of the tube into a mud puddle or any brackish water, any water source, and out the machine comes fresh, pure, clean, drinkable water. Whoa. <laughs> and with Judith, with your connections, um, with your connections to what I would imagine would be uh, the higher income group, uh, beings that, that I'm sure I can't afford to go on your tours, but um, 
with your connections, if you go to DECA Research, D-E-K-A Research, and uh, contact those people about the water vape, the uh, vapor compression uh, distiller, um, he's looking for uh, investors in this machine wow. and uh, applications, and I'm sure that uh, with your connections and the uh, what I would imagine is the uh, the people with the dollars um, that that you may have connections with uh, can maybe put together something to where this device can be uh, made very widespread over there where they absolutely need it. Thank, uh, you. thank you. I really appreciate you giving that to us. And I'm sure Judith will, will check up on that. And, and I'll be checking up on that to have him come into the studio for a show. <laughs> Thanks very much for that idea. Well, that'd be a great combination, wouldn't it? You could sure. just put them together and, and, and there wouldn't be any problem. Oh, we've got another call. Yes, do you have a question for Judith? Yes, do you have a question for Judith? Hello? Hi. Do you have a question for Judith? Yes, I do. Shall I keep the volume on or down? Uh, well, you can. It's fine in here. Go ahead. Ask your question. Oh, okay. My, my my question is. Well, first I'd like to commend her for the for for the for the well work. But she okay. mentioned that that she is of the older generation. There. Well, you know. Of course, we all know. At least if you followed history, what happened to the older generation that was there, yes. and is right. there any feeling there that the United Nations should have done something during that time? Well, the country was so closed off, you know, and I think it happened at a time when Americans were sick and tired of hearing about Southeast Asia, and so I think that at first we didn't want to acknowledge that the Khmer Rouge had taken over the very day that our Vietnam soldiers and, and left the Starlight Hotel in Vietnam. And so I think that, um, that uh, the world didn't want to know what the catastrophe was going on then. Right. And so, you know, it, you know probably the UN didn't want to know either, yeah. so everybody was kind of shut out of the picture. But fortunately for, for us, we have people like you going in there now and changing things around by utilizing the charitable gifting mentality of a lot of people. And, and I know for a fact that a lot of your people are not well healed people. No, they're not. There are people <laughs> that make a decision, yeah, I'm going to go do this. Yes. And then they save up and go. So, yes. yeah, and it's, and it's something that I think every person. It's not as much have, as you think yeah, it is. And it's, and and we don't stay in the fancy hotel. Yeah. <laughs> See, if you, if you stay with the elephants, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm so glad you could join us Thank today, you. Judith. I really appreciate this. And we're going to have to have an update. And you Super. have to bring me back more pictures. And mm. I'll take a small elephant. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I really want to appreciate, uh, want to thank you for coming and thank sharing you. this with us. Because this has really been something that has made me feel a whole lot better about the tourist industry. <laughs> and frankly, I don't care what your carbon footprint is because I think what you're doing <laughs> far outweighs any carbon use that you happen to be doing. Thank and you. I commend I hope you, you can for come doing with it. Me someday. It's a blast. I certainly hope to plan to do it. So thank you also for joining us today with uh, Freedom TV. And I do hope that you can join us in future shows, our show next week is going to be a very interesting one. It's, it was Northwest Medical Teams, and now they're called Medical Teams International. Again, another organization totally funded by the gifts of charity. Join us next week on Freedom TV. For the pain that it's been through. She's been made to suffer For the profit of a few Storm clouds are out forming Winds of change now touch our shores I hear forefathers are crying as the dreams been cruised America
Amen.